So we've arrived, as was inevitable, at the third of today's uh, sessions of the afternoon. In this session, Caroline is going to unveil the exclusive results from the Global Fleet Management Survey 2012. Fleet Europe conducted a survey amongst multinational corporations to better understand the global dynamics of the car fleet market and confirm trends in consumer buying behavior. Caroline will discuss the main key findings with a panel of fleet experts who I'd like to invite to come up and take their seats here. This will be the seat of Caroline and the others you can fight about who wants the best one. Obviously, the man who will have the best chance of the best seat is Johan Verbois, General Manager, Fleet and Network at Toyota Motor Europe. Thank you very much. Uh, please join us also Tony Elliott, Elliot, Director Europe at ARI Strategic Services Group. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Martin Jan, director, Managing Director at Volkswagen Group Fleet International. Uh, Hans Dahmen, Managing Partner at Fleet Vision. Ah, okay. So Keith, uh, uh, Keith Skolan, that is your seat. <laughs> Thank you very much. Keith Skolan is Global Fleet Manager at IWT. Caroline, please. Thank you, Toby. Gentlemen, a big thank you to all of you uh, for having accepted uh, to participate in this panel discussion on global fleet management. So indeed, today we're going to share with you uh, a few key findings of the survey. The questionnaire was completed by 37 fleet executives of global companies. More than half of them are active in all of the six regions of the world. We're dealing with relatively large fleets, uh, the average fleet size counting around 10,000 vehicles. One of the first questions we asked was to establish whether globalization is indeed a trend on the minds of our survey group. Well, and yes, globalization is on their minds. Only 20% of those surveyed don't think at all about globalizing their fleet. And 80% has already taken some steps, some steps towards fleet globalization or is planning to do so within two to five years. Yesterday, ladies and gentlemen, Fleet Europe organized an IFMI session on the topic of global fleet management. And on this slide, you can see the level of globalization for the participating companies. Almost 85% of them already has a global fleet mindset. And you can see that, well, 29% of the participants already have some global initiatives. You see 24% who has already a global team. And finally, 29% uh, saying that, well, yes, we are in a global fleet management environment. So I'm coming to you now. Keith, your company has vehicles on all continents with the largest volumes in the US and in Europe. Can you share with us at what level of globalization your company is? Uh, today we're currently just uh, at the beginning stages uh, of globalizing our fleet where we've set up regional programs and some local, but now we've come to the realization, or at least a management team has come to the realization that it's time to try to consolidate that. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you see the future? How do you see you go really well, the target is to look at the suppliers, both the fleet management and also the manufacturers, and to see who could possibly um, support us across all the countries that we're in, and also to be uh, which ones are the most effective. Um, obviously, not everyone can be uh, the, the best cost effective in each country, so we'll look mm -hmm. at that also. Okay, thank you, Keith. So, next question is for uh, you, Mr. Yam. Do you think that the slogan, uh, think global, act local, will evolve in the near future to become think global and act global? 
Well, uh, I think that the, the world is uh, too big and too complex uh, to, have one, uh, to have one policy. And what we have seen is that there are several regions uh, like Europe, like North America, like South America, or, or ASEAN, or, or China, where you can implement uh, very similar policies. Uh, but to have one policy for, for the whole world, uh, I think it would be very, uh, very difficult. And um, I think that uh, we should not lose the, the big picture. Mm -hmm. I think companies should uh, implement uh, uh, their policies and strategies globally, but at the same time uh, make sure that they, in these regions and locally, achieve their local goals. So I think it will be still uh, more uh, uh, think globally and act uh, locally. Okay, thank you so much. Moving to the next result. So we are also asked the multinationals in our survey which aspects of the fleet policy are globally driven. Most popular answer, number one, CO2 levels. Number two, the choice of an OEM or leasing company. Number three, the financial methods. As for the elements that are mostly decided on a local or regional level, those are the actual car budgets, the driver management and driver satisfaction. And on the third place, issues regarding safety. So, Johan, I'm turning to you now. How can an OEM help a fleet client to set and achieve global CO2 targets? Yeah, it, uh, it looks almost unfair to give me one minute and then you're asking a question to Toyota about CO2, but <laughs> we will try. No, I think the first thing is key is to uh, understand customer requirements because I think everyone has a different view on environment is it only your CO2? Do you incorporate other emissions? So I think that is the key starting point. Secondly, I think, uh, and indeed, if you talk from, if you go from local to more global, you talk less about cars and more about what's the solution? What is, what is the actually service? Of course, cars help, and people like to talk about what's coming, but they need a solution right now, and not only in Europe, but actually in every single market. So I think that's the key challenge if you move from regional to global. Okay, thank you, Juan. And my next question is for Hans. Um, what do you think of the results to find safety on, well, the right side, so with the elements that are at least global? Is that a surprise to you? Um, well, it's, it's not a surprise because it is a rather complicated topic. Uh, many people that have to make these decisions rely, first of all, on the manufacturers to produce very safe vehicles with all the equipment in there. Uh, there's more people that are now considering to put additional equipment in, such as mobile island and so on, that can help you uh, manage the topic. But um, yeah, it is very complicated. It's very different region by region. Um, I must admit, many multinationals have already health and safety standards that mm -hmm. facilitate the process. So, you know, not having the full understanding of why they responded the way, um, the way they did. Uh, I still believe there is an opportunity out there, and I still think a lot of people are working on it, although mm -hmm. not specifically from a procurement perspective. Okay. So in your mind, you would move safety to the left I would side? have responded differently, but um, it just matters on in which position these people are to respond to the question. Okay. Thank you, Hans. Next slide. What are the main reasons to go global? The most popular answer was to save costs by process harmonization. And the second most popular one, to save costs by achieving economies of scale. So now, Tony, I'm turning to you. Considering your experience with multinational fleets, how would you advise companies to balance the internal gains, their internal gains with the external ones? So internal processes versus suppliers. I would say, first of all, you have to decide what it is you want before you can go out to buy something. Mm -hmm. And quite often I find companies haven't done that. And so they lay themselves open to perhaps being sold something that they didn't particularly need or want. Um, and, and I'm also finding now that the external uh, processes are where the smart money is. Um, so you, you, you decide on your internal processes and then you go out to a market and you don't actually look for the best, smartest uh, product out there, um, which all comes back to that root cause of not deciding what you want. 
and especially outside of Europe, which, I mean, Europe is pretty mature now, but outside of Europe, it's quite extraordinary what people have purchased uh, outside of Europe and the consequences in cost terms uh, externally uh, from that that are now, they're now having to look at it to try and resolve those issues, which is always much more difficult to correct a problem than it was to stop it from happening in the first place. Okay, thank you. So if uh, you're asking a question, why to go global, what are the main reasons? The next slide is, uh, what are the main obstacles? Well, uh, looking at this chart here, the lack of global offer, both from the side of the manufacturers and also on the side from the leasing companies, was the most popular answers. Other obstacles that were mentioned include processes that are too complicated, so now we're talking inside the company, the lack of either internal sponsorship or mandates, and finally, the lack of transparent information. So, Tony, the next one is also for you. How should we cope with the lack of transparent information? Which measure would you advise us to take? Well, generally speaking, there's two people in the marriage, and um, they should talk to one another, mm -hmm. uh, having come from the other side of the, of the fence. Um, there's always been this talk about be, the lack of transparency. The lease companies, the operating lease companies, have the information. That information is available to customers if that information is used in the right way. And I think a lot of people on the leasing side are scared that if we show you where we're making our profits, you'll try and get them. Um, that's not always the case with the more professional purchases that we deal with. And we should open up and we should be more transparent in the operating lease field. The information is there and it depends what you want it for and how you can use that information, A, to reduce the risk for the leasing company, but also to make it uh, more cost effective for the, for the, for the, uh, the customer. And generally speaking, they're two mature people talking to one another and I don't understand why they don't come up with a solution. But there's this underlying distrust, if you like, of we're hiding everything so you can't see it. I didn't see that in the companies that I've worked in. Perhaps the customers have, and I'm, I apologize for that. But uh, if you ask for transparency and you're prepared to use that to reduce your costs and reduce the risks of, of the lease company, great. Mm -hmm. Just ask for it. But ask specifically what it is you want and why you want it, and I'm sure you'll get it. Okay, great. So plenty of opportunities to ask a lot of things today. Uh, next slide. Uh, companies that have already taken steps towards globalization have a different perception of the obstacles compared to companies that have not yet. The obstacle most overrated by decision makers that are not yet involved in global fleet management is the lack of global offer from manufacturers and leasing companies. Whereas the most underrated obstacle is the company's own internal processes and organization. So Hans, especially for those companies that have yet to go global, what can be done to overcome this misappreciation of the obstacles ahead? Well, first of all, I'm very grateful for the question um, because my first answer is hire a very good independent consultant to, to help you. Um, secondly, I would say that this important, there's two marketplaces you need to work in. Start with your internal marketplace. Understand what your requirements are understand what your stakeholders need, what the board expects you to deliver, and based on that, build your plan. Then go out to your supply chain and work with them as partners. See them not to, to as, a, as a commodity provider, but use their know-how, use their experience, and I think you will come to the, um, to the best possible results. Okay, that's very clear, thank you. Uh, next results. We ask the companies for their most important requirements towards OEMs and their willingness to go global. The answers, price, transparency and consistency, global reporting and actual decision-making power. This top three is followed by having a, glue, a truly global presence, a global bonus program and a real influence on the local market. So questions for the manufacturers. Johan first. Both global reporting and global decision-making power are in the top three of the expectations. How can an OMM make progress in these two areas? Well, I think um, I can explain that it's hard, I think, and I think we need to clearly g g manage expectations. We started with our own project a year and a half ago, and we now will uh, 
launch our global offer. Um, but it's very hard because I think overall OEMs are, although that we are maybe one of the most global companies to, together with some other OEMs, it's very decentralized. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of the companies have full ownership of every single entity most OEMs don't have. Although that our ownership structure is about 85% of the volume we have in, in actually ownership. So now we will, we have now made specific uh, fleet service level agreements with all of those single entities so that we can clearly follow compliance to whatever customer wants. Well, maybe not whatever they want, because as I said, I think expectation is a bit too high. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a lot of, uh, I think we need to be honest about on what elements we can serve them and which elements we don't have under control. The only thing I, I, I still would like to add is, um, I think as OEMs and as customers, we want to achieve the same thing. So I think we need your support to really understand what is the key. Let's understand each other's uh, challenges, objectives, and it will also help us to really raise the bar so that we can uh, improve our services on a global fleet level. Okay, so cl clear demand for partnerships. Yes, indeed. Okay, Martin, of course. Why is it so difficult to guarantee price consistency on the global level? And do you think that OEMs are willing to make an effort in this uh, respect? Yeah, well, why do I always get the easiest questions? No, that's, uh, <laughs> and I, I'm not sure I can, uh, I can answer this question on behalf of all the OEMs. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, first of all, we have to ask ourselves, what, what is price consistency? What, what do you mean uh, under that? Is, is it one price uh, all over the globe? Or is it not changing the price over the course of one year or, or two years? Mm -hmm. It was uh, under geographical scope. Yeah. The well, I think that the question of one price, which we very often get, um, is you can argue that if, if we do something like that, who would bear the risk of uh, exchange rate uh, uh, in Switzerland? Uh, who would bear the risk of uh, inflation in Argentina? I mean, the world is so diverse that, that offering one price for the, for the product uh, globally is almost impossible. And also, which level would you take? Would you take the price level of, of India? which would make our customers very happy, mm -hmm. but that would make us broke very quickly? Or are we going to take uh, the price level of uh, France or uh, Denmark, which would make us very happy, but uh, that would be unacceptable for our, for our customers? Um, and also, we do not have one global product. I do not believe in, in global car. Uh, yeah? it's, it's, it's not working. You have just different needs in Europe, uh, in Brazil, in the US, in, in, in China. Mm -hmm. And even if you look at um, global gurus, companies who are uh, really global, like Coca-Cola or uh, uh, McDonald's, they also do not have just one product for the whole globe, and they do not have one, one price uh, for the whole uh, globe. So I do not believe uh, this price consistency uh, truly that, that it's possible. I think what is important is that we offer the best uh, value proposition for all the regions. And I think this is our mutual goal. What, what, what our clients want is to have uh, the most efficient uh, fleet, the best total cost of ownership. And uh, there are different ways how to achieve that mm -hmm. in Brazil, in France, and, and in China. So we should focus on uh, helping our clients uh, fulfilling the global policy of, of this kind, but still uh, finding the best local solution. And I think if we have uh, uh, more power uh, over our network, and if our clients have more power o o over the network, we can, uh, in this spirit of cooperation, find, uh, find a solution. But one size fits all will never work. Uh, OK, that's very clear. Yeah. Thank you very much. When we look at the results of the, sur of the survey uh, for the most important requirements for the leasing companies, then again, global report and capability score very high. And Keith, this is a question for you. Why is global, uh, global reporting so important? And what do you expect to have it happen in this area? More to the point, what is it really that you want? Well, we always rely on our suppliers mm -hmm. to capture the data. They have um, the details that we're uh, required to report. 
and we don't have the capabilities to be able to capture all that, and especially with multiple suppliers. So we always reach out to them to try to get as much information as possible. Mm -hmm. And it would be ideal to have one system that would report from all, you know, globally from all the suppliers, be able to upload and then be able to basically manipulate that data from there. But it's, you also have to know what you're going to do with that data. You know, just like we said earlier, you know, you can get all the information, but if you don't know what you're doing with it and it's just, you're collecting it, it's, it's not the, the point that we're trying to get. But that's, ultimately, it's let's try to have one system, and if it's possible, I'm not sure, it'd be fairly complicated, but be able to capture that, and then from there be able to work with it. And of course, all web-based, wonderful. Okay, that's very clear and a very clear request too. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know that we have the great privilege to have the six uh, executives of the major leasing companies a little bit later during this forum, so we'll keep this question in mind also for that panel discussion. Um, another slide. Uh, well, finally, we also ask the decision makers in our survey what information they would need to help them go global. And as you see, they're looking for information to understand fleet management in more exotic countries. Also high on the list are both showing by example aspects of case studies and best practices, and an area where you can exchange IDs with peers. So, ladies and gentlemen, we understood the needs of these global fleet companies, and I'm proud to announce that Nexus Communication will launch a new global media and community soon. And In a world of ongoing globalization, compelling information and analyzes are key to trace opportunities. The Global Fleet Network is the first networking and cross-media platform for international companies willing to optimize their fleet management through globalization. It provides you with in-depth knowledge and up-to-date information on global and regional fleet management as well as on upcoming economies and the BRIC countries. The Global Fleet Network focuses on procurement, sourcing, human resource professionals and fleet managers on an executive level. The membership-based community delivers quality studies, trends, and best practices. The Global Fleet Network is your ultimate destination to learn, read, share, and interact amongst Global Fleet executives. Pre-register now on globalfleet.com. Okay, and then we had the lights, great. Ladies and gentlemen, so I'm very proud to uh, well, present you our new project at Nexus Communication Global Fleet, the Executive Network. With this new digital media and networking platform, we want to help the global fleet sector to evolve towards global fleet management. Global Fleet will be rolled out during 2013. The first concrete product that we will launch is a guide everything you need to know about fleet management in Brazil. And after Brazil, we will cover emerging markets like China, Russia, Turkey, and others. Next year, we plan to organize a business trip to China and to organize the first global fleet management forum to help corporations to understand the Chinese fleet markets. We all know that we have entered the era of collaboration, so the purpose of this community concept, ladies and gentlemen, is to create a platform where you can share expertise with your peers and learn from the experiences of other executives. 
a platform where you will also discover in-depth analysis, best practices, of course, and expertise. So as from today, you can pre-register on our website. Thank you so much, and gentlemen, thank you for your contribution today. Ladies and gentlemen, um, this was the first part of the forum. The sponsors are very pleased to invite you to a coffee break if you'd like to join them in the Fleet Europe Village, share your thoughts, discover uh, the products and the services that are on offer. There's one thing that I would like to mention. I thought that I would change the order and put it here, which is that on your seat, you will have seen an evaluation form. Um, if you don't have anybody to talk to, you don't like the coffee and you want a little time on your own, it might be a good moment just to fill in the evaluation form. In the original script that I was given, of which I've made lots of changes and things like that, it said, and I quote, you may gently handle them to the hostesses and team. So, ladies and gentlemen, when you have filled in your form, please gently handle them, all of the hostesses and all of the team. Thank you very much. Enjoy your coffee, and we'll see you at 3.45. 3.45, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.